Welcome to the Distrust and Disparities podcast, Voices from the Margins of Healthcare. On this podcast, we will explore both current and historical cases of medical injustices within the American healthcare system. We will get into how we can overcome this systemic mistreatment, advocate for ourselves, and close the gap on poor health outcomes and disparities. I'm your host, Jasmine Moore, a registered nurse, and I am joined by my co-host and good friend, Camille White. I put forward and I maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. This is how black people get killed. When you send them home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody, maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. On episode eight, we discuss Dr. Susan Moore's tragic battle with COVID-19. She was a black doctor who took to social media to expose a hospital's racially biased treatment she received as a patient. And we highlight Dr. Kismika Corbett, an immunologist who was one of the scientists who helped develop the Moderna vaccine for COVID-19. Hi, Camille. Hey, Jasmine. Welcome to 2022. I feel like my Baltimore accent came out when I'm saying that. So I'm trying to say it, pronounce the T's. <laughs> yes, we are in 2022. And like everyone says at this point, I still feel like I'm in 2020. It's just one big blur. Right. Like, you know, I was trying to be like cautiously optimistic, but today mm-hmm. I'm just grateful to be alive. Have not set any goals for this year. You know, mentally I have some stuff, but I haven't Mm -hmm. like, usually I'm excited to sit down and write things down and also just reflect. I'm at the point, I just, I'm just trying to block things out. I'm just trying to take it one day at a time. Like that's, that's all you can do. Just focus on that. Because if you think yep. too far ahead, if you start thinking about the CDC guidelines that just got released, mm. what type of sense they are making. Like, you know, you None. want people to take this pandemic seriously, but then they release some of these guidelines and you're like, this is a joke. Yes. This is a joke. They CDC just like, you know, just... Just do you, do you at this point? Like, yeah, I mean, they just doing the same song and dance they've been doing since day one. Okay, right. I'm at like, this point. Mm-mm. I feel like I have more common sense than they do with their guidelines. I can figure it out for myself. Right. The next thing is gonna be like, you don't have to wear your mask over your nose. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just cover your bottom lip. <laughs> God. <laughs> That's coming <laughs> at this point. <laughs> That's what we're, we're we're coming to. And just like speaking of COVID, because we were like, you know, last year I was like, you know, COVID is a big topic, mm-hmm. but I really don't feel like talking about it and processing yeah. it right now. But you know, going into this year it, with the surge and mm-hmm. the uptick in infections, you know, mm-hmm. we wanted. I had this case that we're going to discuss. You know, I had it on our topics list. I was like, let's just jump into it. Let's just talk about it this week. And we wanted to discuss Dr. Susan Moore. She was born in Jamaica, but she grew up in Michigan. She studied engineering at Kettering University in Flint, Michigan, and she eventually earned her medical degree from the University of Michigan Medical School. So she operated her own family practice, so she was a general family practitioner. Mm -hmm. Her family also reported she had a medical history of sarcoidosis, which is an inflammatory disease that attacks the lungs. If you're familiar, I remember that's what Bernie Mac died of. Okay. And it's just a really harsh disease. Her family reported that she had to go to the hospital frequently for hospital treatments. It can affect like your immune system because I believe you have to take steroids, which can lower your immune system. And it just causes like a lot of pain in like your joints and in your lungs and can cause difficulty breathing. Mm. So, So Like, of course, then she would be someone that would be completely vulnerable, especially vulnerable to Mm COVID-19 then. Yeah, highly susceptible. And she's also a doctor, so she's probably treating patients. Patients are coming in Mm -hmm. with COVID-19 as well. Yeah. 
And also, according to her son, he was 19 at the time of this case, Henry Muhammad, he stated, and I quote, nearly every time she went to the hospital, she had to advocate for herself, fight for something in some way or shape or form just to get baseline proper care. And the fact that like every time, every time she went in there, it's just like she's fighting for herself. She's constantly fighting for herself. That's completely ridiculous. Yeah. So just imagine, like we already know this, just baseline. She has this medical history of sarcoidosis and, you know, it requires her to go to the hospital or just to get checked in and each time having to fight, Mm -hmm. you know, for, like she said, baseline proper care. You know, not nothing Mm -hmm. extra. Just baseline care. On November 29th, 2020, um, Dr. Moore, she was admitted to the hospital. It's IU Health North Hospital, and it's in Carmel, Indiana. She had tested positive for COVID-19, and she was having symptoms that required hospitalization. Back in Mm -hmm. uh, 2020, you know, that's the height of the pandemic. On December 4th, that's when she took to Facebook to document what was going on. She said, you know, the way I'm being treated, you know, somebody needs to hear this. Something needs to be done because it's just not fair. I had seen clips of the video going around Facebook and also Mm -hmm. on Instagram. And then I... I took the time to listen to the whole, it's like a seven and a half minute video where she's recording herself and it just angered me so much. It's devastating when it's just like, this is a doctor. This this is Mm -hmm. a doctor. Why? Like, this is the care she's getting. And it's not to say that like anyone who is a health professional is in any way like above someone, but it's just like, this is what y'all do to your own still. And it's just like, oh, but I know why, because she's black and because she's a woman. And Mm -hmm. you can easily disregard what she's saying because that's what y'all do to us all the time. You don't listen. You just don't listen because you don't really care. And you have your own assumptions and biases. And instead of listening to your patients, you you just ignore us and think that you know better because how possibly can a black person really know what's going on with their own body? In the video, she's like, she has oxygen in her nose and she's also, you can just tell she's like struggling to breathe a little bit or just taking deep breaths. So in the video, she talks about, she's being treated by this white doctor. She says his name is Dr. Bannock. And she says, like, he wants to send me home. He's talking about, I'm not short of breath. Basically, he says, you should just go home right now. Like, you're not short of breath. Like she's And she's like, what? I am short of breath. What what are you talking about? And then Mm -hmm. she also pointed out she only got two treatments of the remdesivir. And that was the antiviral treatment that they were um, using to treat COVID. And then he also says... I don't feel comfortable giving you any more narcotics. And she's like, what? And in the video, she says she would just felt crushed. And she felt like he was treating her like a drug addict. Like we said, she has sarcoidosis. So she is most likely taking pain medication for that. Mm -hmm. Adding on, and like I said, that disease affects her lungs. So adding on COVID-19, which is a respiratory disease where you already can't breathe on top of that. And just being in so much pain. And then he's Mm -hmm. making you seem like you're a drug addict for asking for pain medication. It's crazy where I'm sure that's all in her file. That's all in her record. Mm -hmm. So then why is it that you immediately assume that, oh, she's just here complaining? You you just treat Mm -hmm. her as an addict based off of, I don't know what it would be based off of other than you're a racist. So then she also talks about she talked to the hospital's patient advocate. She let her know what's going on. And basically the patient advocate, you know, they listened, but they were basically like, it's nothing we can really do. And she's like, oh, okay. But then she demanded, then she was like, okay, if you guys can't do anything, if you can't improve my care, I want to be transferred to another hospital. I need something else. You guys aren't treating me. I want to be transferred to another hospital facility. Doing this, so she, like I said, she was admitted the 29th. So they ordered a CAT scan somewhere around the 4th or the 4th or the 5th. So the CAT scan, you know, showed worsening infiltrates, which is worsening of like the pneumonia. Basically, the infection is getting worse. 
So that's why she can't breathe and that's why she's having pain. So she was like, you know, once they saw on the images, which she had to demand that she get a CT done, that's when they ordered more pain medication for her. But it's Mm. like the, why does she have to fight and beg? Y'all were going to discharge her. Then y'all got this CT. It's like, oh, Oh, actually, there is something wrong. She does need this pain medication. Oh, now we can finally uh, acknowledge and say she's fighting tooth and nail while literally struggling to breathe. And and then and then finally after that, y'all do something. Right. Like the patient is telling you she can't breathe. She can't. She's in pain. That Mm -hmm. would trigger like something is going on. She uh, seems to be getting worse. Like yeah. if you're giving her, it's either the pain medication we are giving her is not enough or the disease is progressing. Like mm-hmm. it's getting worse. Like we mm-hmm. need to do something. You know, she's constantly complaining, complaining. And then in the video, she talks about they did order the pain medication. But then even once they ordered it, it was a struggle to get the medication. So she asked for the pain medication and the nurse, she said it took her about like two and a half hours to get the medication. And then when she asked the nurse, um, you know, what what took so long? The nurse mm-hmm. said, you're not my only patient. I have five other patients. What? Mm. And then, mind you, I'm paraphrasing. They went back and forth. Well, she was like, you know, mm-hmm. I know you're not my only patient, but what took so long? And basically, the nurse was just rude, like going back and forth. Because I worked in the hospital, in the emergency department, I know how it is. Like you say, you're going to come back or as soon as you leave the room, you're called somewhere or sometimes mm-hmm. the medication is not there. You got to request it mm-hmm. like the order is in, but it's not coming from pharmacy. Things can hold you up. If something like that happened, I have a patient in pain and say, I can't get the, to them right away. And they were like, oh, it took so long. I'm like, I'm sorry. It took me so long. You know, you can, you know, tell them, you know, there was delays from pharmacy, but I have the medicine. You know, we're going to get this pain under track and make sure, you know, we keep the pain under control. But I'm not going back and forth with a patient, even if it's been like 15 minutes and the patient's like, oh, you was gone two hours. It's no use of going mm-hmm. back and forth with a patient. You know, they're in no. pain. Like, you just acknowledge, like, I'm you- sorry it took me so long. I'm sorry you're in mm-hmm. pain. Here's the medication. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'll come back to reevaluate to see if it worked. You know, we try to get on top of this pain. But literally, they went back and forth. And at one point, the nurse was like, oh, I know you're a doctor or whatever. And then yeah, he said something like Black Lives Matter. Like I was out here protesting for Black Lives Matter. So I know I was just like, oh, what <laughs> in the world? like how did like it's this whole exchange? I'm like, what in the world? Like just so, give her the pain medication, yeah. acknowledge that she's in pain and keep it moving. Like mm-hmm. you do not go back. And That's forth. what's crazy where. No, that's not productive in any way where you want to be like, oh, I have other patients, but now you got the motherfucking time to sit here and go back and forth with someone. I thought you had other patients. Why aren't you going to your other patients? That's when it's just like, see what you're saying don't even make sense. Because if you had other patients, you would be like, I am sorry about that. I got hung up doing this, that, or the other. There's a lot going on. Like you said, I'm here now. Here's your medication. Let's get this under control. Hey, I, like I said, I got other patients. I got other people to go see. I'll be back though. I will. I will come back to see how you're doing. But instead, you got the time to now go back and forth with this woman and fuss about. Oh, I did this and oh, I did that and I was out in the streets right. protesting. Nobody asked you all of that. Nobody asked you all that. That's you reaching real hard with that one. You get into that territory. I got a black friend. Nobody asked you. Nobody right. asked you that. And that don't that don't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything at all. Okay, and. Like, uh, uh, that's so frustrating. That is so frustrating where it's like such deflection and you're missing the point. And instead of doing your job and caring for this woman and if anyone, if you could put yourself in her shoes, you'd understand she's in pain. So yes, she is like, where were you? Why is it taking so long? Because not only with like the two hours that it took you to finally get her meds that that however long that took beforehand for her to fight to even get to that point. She's just been struggling for hours now, but mm-hmm. but you got the time now to continue to have her in pain because you want to go back and forth and tell her about shit that she didn't even ask about. No, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Right. Give her it's her just... pain medicine and treat her like a person. Right. 
And for her to, you know, have to beg for pain medication for the doctor, there's already this long history of people not believing Black people experience Mm -hmm. pain and just the whole thing around that. And then you have the medication order. You know, things happen, but just give her the medication. Why Mm -hmm. are you guys, why are you going back and forth? Like, I could not believe this. Like, you know... Patients can say and do things, but you got to understand that they are sick. Yeah. But this whole dialogue, it was just unnecessary. Unnecessary. Mm. She even, she said in the, one of the quotes, she was like, I maintain if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. And then she also said, this is how black people get killed when they send you home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's hard when, yeah, she's a doctor, so she kind of does know how to navigate the system in a way where most most people, I know I wouldn't know to be like, well, if you're not going to treat me, I demand that you send me somewhere else. A lo- like, that's already mm-hmm. hard. So, like, she is trying her best to navigate the system. She's literally going to a patient advocate that's supposed to be there to help her navigate the system. And mm-hmm. this is how Black people get killed, because not only do you not have that knowledge then on top of that you don't have people helping you you don't have people listening to you and you're dismissed and when you're dismissed and your symptoms are dismissed your pain is dismissed then you do end up getting killed because Mm -hmm. they don't care about you they don't really see you as a person they don't value your life like they should be where it's just like nobody told you to go into this profession nobody forced you to be here you chose to be here and usually most of the time it's because you you said you want to help people then fucking help everybody help everybody not just who you think deserves help or who you think is in real pain you don't know someone's pain because you're not them So she escalated her complaint. Like I said, she spoke to the patient advocate. She ended up speaking with the chief medical officer. So Mm -hmm. she wrote in an update that he assured her that she would get better care and also that diversity training would be held. She also reported on her Facebook that she found out that this doctor, Dr. Bannock, he had a poor reputation dating as far back as three years. I don't know how she found out, but Mm -hmm. maybe some other people, you know... People talk. They was like, oh, I had him before. Yep, he Mm -hmm. did the same thing. Mm -hmm, Yeah. That's just him. So she ended up getting a new doctor and her pain was better managed. So even though she her she got a new doctor things were improving she also felt that the staff was less responsive and that the care was just lacking and on december 7th they discharged dr susan moore from the iu health north hospital so she reported to her son that she wasn't feeling like 100% better or that much better but she was eager to get home So just 12 hours after being discharged, she had to go back to the hospital. Her son, he reported that when the ambulance arrived to pick her up, she could barely walk. She was having difficulty breathing. Once she got to the hospital, she reported that she spiked a temperature of 103 and that her blood pressure was down to 80 over 60 and her heart rate was Mm. up to 132. And as a nurse, those vital signs are horrible. It's a sign of infection. It's a sign of something is going wrong. They Mm -hmm. took her to a different hospital. She Mm -hmm. was diagnosed with, in addition to having COVID-19 pneumonia, she also had bacterial pneumonia. So that's double pneumonia. She already has Mm -hmm. a chronic health condition that affects her lungs and her breathing. So this is is not looking good. But she, she reported that the care that she was receiving at the new hospital was compassionate and that they were, you know, treating her properly. But like I said, having both bacterial pneumonia and COVID-19 pneumonia, that's that's not good. Mm -mm. So eventually her health started to quickly deteriorate. On December 10th, they ended up having to intubate Dr. Moore. And basically she was put on a ventilator. So basically this means there was a machine that was controlling her breathing, that was doing the breathing for her. According to her son, she was 100% reliant on the ventilators. He and his grandparents, they came up to the hospital just to visit her. He reported that was the last time that he visited her on December 20th. 
Dr. Susan Moore, she ended up passing away at the age of 52. Mm. So sad. It really Mm. is. And it's sad where she clearly shouldn't have been discharged at all Mm -hmm. to then so quickly have to call for emergency care to take her back to another hospital, sort of thankfully Mm -hmm. in a way where she at least got better care and more compassionate care, like she said. But then the fact that then they were able to, I guess, investigate and and properly diagnose her and, and listen to what her body and what she was saying was going on to not only say, yeah, you have COVID-19 pneumonia, but like you have bacterial pneumonia. It's then makes me wonder like, so because of the care she got at the first hospital, what did they miss? Mm-hmm. What, what, what they, they not pay attention to had maybe they... They cared more about her health and about what Mm -hmm. was going on with her body than maybe they wouldn't have been in such a rush to send her home and go, well, you're okay now. Goodbye. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Right. She was admitted on the 29th and she's complaining of pain. She didn't get her CAT scan till the 4th. And then that's when y'all started to adjust her pain regimen. When you're in pain, you don't want to take deep breaths. And with covid and it affecting your lungs, you need to take deep breaths and be able to get oxygen. So if you're in pain, you're uncomfortable, you're not going to want to take deep breaths. You're not going to want to move and do everything that will help you to get better. And just ignoring her pain, ignoring her when she's saying she's short of breath and, you know, something else needs to be done. Why did it take so long to get scans? You know, what else could have been done? You know, could interventions have been done quicker or sooner so that we can see a she has bacterial pneumonia. The pneumonia is getting worse. We could have treated her with some antibiotics sooner. So it's just it's just sad, like, the way she was treated. So it brings up to mind the concept of weathering, which is repeated exposure to socioeconomic adversity, racism, perpetual discrimination, and how it can harm your health. So already... We talked about in the beginning how whenever she had to go to the hospital, she had to constantly fight to get baseline care. So just Mm -hmm. each time you have to fight to get care, it's just exhausting. And I feel like this last fight was probably just so draining and, you know, just... You talk to the nurse, you're going back and forth with the nurse. You talk to the doctor, you're getting difficulty there. He's making you feel like a drug addict. Then you talk to the patient advocate and they're like, it's nothing really we can do. You eventually talk to the chief medical officer. You're telling people the same story, everything that's going on. They eventually switch your doctors, but then people are becoming less responsive. They're not really listening to you as well. All that takes a toll on your health, on your body, and then being rushed back to the hospital 12 hours later after being discharged, you're probably exhausted from fighting. Like, even though you're getting better care with COVID, you and having like the double pneumonia and not being able to breathe, you really need that fight, that will to want to breathe yeah. and everything. And just imagine just the toll, like you already having that exhaustive hospital experience from She was admitted um, November 29th and discharged on the 10th. And, you know, you go right back. That's a lot of time in the hospital. And also from an article that I read, Black people, when we get sick, we can't just focus on healing and getting better. We also have to focus on fighting oppression, fighting racial bias, all this at the same time. So it's it's so unfair because... mm -hmm. When you go to a hospital, when you go to sort of any medical facility seeking help for whatever your ailment is, your disease, whatever you're dealing with, you should then feel as though you have you have this team behind you that's going to help you mm-hmm. fight that disease, that ailment, that illness, not people that are just going to fight you and you are then struggling right. to not only deal with what your body is physically going through with that issue. But then you got to deal with the issue of other human beings who don't know how to listen to you. And yeah, that all of that together then turns can turn physical and how your body responds to it where like, yeah, Mm -hmm. it's it's weathering. You are broken down like slowly over time to the point of like you can't you can't fight it anymore. Your body can't physically fight it anymore. Mentally, you can't fight it anymore. Right. After her death and her video of herself that she recorded in the hospital, it went viral, it was going around social media. So the hospital, they eventually, they put out a press release 
And in the press release, they described Dr. Moore as a complex patient. And then Mm. they said, as an organization, we are committed to equity and reducing racial disparities in healthcare. We take accusations of discrimination very seriously and investigate every allegation. They also put, we stand by the commitment and expertise of our caregivers and the quality of care delivered to our patients every day. They said the nursing staff treating Dr. Moore for COVID-19 may have been intimidated by a knowledgeable patient who was using social media to voice her concerns and critique the care they were delivering. So because (laughs) somebody was giving y'all constructive criticism and literally just explaining to people her personal experience and what she was dealing with, they were then too intimidated to do their job properly and care for her. But then originally, too, you said that she was a complex patient. To me, that just screams this black woman was difficult. Mm -hmm. She was a difficult black woman. You know, we demand so much. And that that's what that immediately you call her a complex Mm -hmm. patient. Right. Because they said, you know, I can understand maybe they say she had a complex medical history. Yes. She has, you know, a Mm -hmm. lot of things. But calling somebody a complex patient, that that's cold word for, you know, she was being difficult. She was, you know, asking for too much. She was Mm -hmm. asking too much to get basic care. Care. They were intimidated by her. By this complex right. patient. Right. <sighs> and her son said, he was quoted saying, I don't understand how knowing your medical history is intimidating to a nurse or hospital staff. The patient, you you know your body better than anybody else. Mm-hmm. I, you tell me you're in pain. What you say, your pain is a 10 out of 10. That's your pain. You know your body. You know your history. You know how you respond to certain drugs. You are the expert of your body. And what's Mm -hmm. going on. So you telling the staff, you know, I don't feel right. Something is going on. And you're a doctor. You know the course of treatment. If something is going on, you're complaining of this. You know, they should get a CT. They should be doing extra blood work. Mm -hmm. You know, they should be doing additional treatments. So, you know, you're telling them you're bringing and they're not doing it. And eventually it got to the point where she said on the video, you know, the way I'm being treated is just not fair. So. I'm going to social media. I have no other outlet to voice my complaints. Basically, I want to document what's being done and what's being Mm -hmm. treated. Yeah. And people that heard the hospital's response, you know, there was severe backlash. Like, you're basically blaming the victim. You're you're only saying all this because... Her reaching out to social media and her video went viral. If that only had, you know, a couple of hundred even people view it and sort of got lost in the ether of the Internet, you wouldn't be saying anything at all. Social media was her last resort. She went through the avenues in the hospital that she knew about because she was a doctor of going to the patient advocate, of trying Mm -hmm. to have... Uh, not that she should have had to, but having a whole back and forth with with nurses, having a whole back and forth with doctors, even demanding, okay, you don't want to deal with me, send me somewhere else. She did all mm-hmm. of that. Then she got to the point of talking to the chief medical officer. She went through so many different avenues that she should have mm-hmm. never had to go through to try to get the care she needed. So then, yes, her final result then was like, you know what? I need to document this. I need people to have mm-hmm. a an eyewitness account of like, this is what's going on. Because had she not had that, we wouldn't know anything about her story. Mm -hmm. And another doctor in an article that I was reading, she commented, even on this show, we tell people you need to advocate for yourself. You need to stand up for yourself. She did all that. She's well-educated and still she is blamed. She made the doctors and the nurses feel intimidated So, you know, we tell you to advocate for yourself and then you do. And one lady, she said, just feels like a slap in the face. You're labeled as like angry, upset or volatile. And in this point, intimidating when you stand up for yourself, you advocate for yourself and demand what needs to be done. Like what Mm -hmm. else can you do in these situations? So the hospital, after they released this press release, they got even mm-hmm. further backlash, they ended up conducting an external review. So they did mm-hmm. an independent review. They had 
a panel of six outside experts. They note they said four of them were black, four of the six people were black. And so what they did, they reviewed the medical records, they interviewed hospital personnel, and they also reviewed the organization's policies and procedures. So at the end of the review, they concluded that her death wasn't contributed to, you know, medical management or any like technicalities of care. But they also Mm -hmm. pointed out that there was a lack of empathy and compassion in the care that she received. And they also Mm -hmm. pointed out that not all the providers practice cultural competence and that several caregivers lacked empathy, compassion, and awareness of implicit bias in the delivery and communication of her care. Which is basically, we already knew this. All I'm hearing is that y'all didn't know how to deal with Black people because y'all racist. Y'all don't know how to care for Black people because y'all racist. Y'all was racist from the beginning. Y'all had this these racial bias. She tried to stand up for herself. Y'all weren't compassionate. Y'all didn't show any empathy. Mm-mm. Like, this is a hospital. Like, how? How are y'all allowed to so-called care for people and, and help people when you literally can't, what, put yourself in someone else's shoes for a split second and go, this woman is saying she's in pain. Let's figure that out and let's ease her pain. It, right. It's just it's just simple things. Yes, Make com- her feel heard and yes. seen. We already knew this. You hire, like you said, an expert panel to come and investigate what we already know. Mm-hmm. And then they say, basically the hospital's like, oh, we conduct an external review. We're going to start doing diversity training. We are committed to being an anti-racist health system. And, you know, we're going to work on respecting and valuing the dignity of our patients. You know, they're going to release these general statements They're going to require all employees to go through some type of like general diversity training. Most likely it's going to be some type of online modules where you just got to click, click through. You'll Mm -hmm. answer a couple of questions. You'll get a certificate. But are they really going to sit down, especially with the doctors and nurses that were directly involved with her care? Like Mm -hmm. you said, if it's this doctor that has this reputation of treating patients a certain way and people having issues with them. Are you going to really sit down with them, address, like, how come we're always getting these complaints? We Patients are complaining of these same things. Are you really going to go directly to the source? You need to treat everyone mm-hmm. with compassion and care and listen to them, no matter the system. Because it's racism is the underlining thread of the stories that we talk yes. about. Like, that yes. is the main factor that needs to be done. And like you said, racism and whether it affects your body and it affects your lifespan. And the last update on May 5th of this year, Dr. Moore, her estate, they filed paperwork to file a wrongful death claim. They had the court records sealed for the case, so I don't have any other updates. So now we want to transition over to where we typically feature an organization. And so today we want to talk about Dr. Kaznika Corbett, and she is an immunologist at the U.S. National Institutes of Health, or NIH. And she is a Black woman who was one of the scientists who in early 2020 helped to develop an mRNA-based vaccine for COVID-19, the Moderna one specifically. Dr. Corbett, she has over 15 years of experience studying viruses, respiratory viruses, such as influenza and even the coronavirus. I was reading up, she, even before the pandemic started, she was studying COVID-19 and also working with mRNA. She's won several awards in immunology. She was working with the NIH team in Bethesda, Maryland. Shout out to Maryland. She played a huge part in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. In addition to working on the vaccine, she did recognize that there was vaccine hesitancy, especially in marginalized communities, especially like African-American and even Latino communities. So in addition to working in the lab, she was also putting on a lot of virtual events with 
churches and communities just talking about the science. And in one article, she was saying, my role is to deliver the science in a digestible way. Basically, she's letting people know how she developed it. Because I know when the vaccine came out, people are like, oh, it came out too quick. What is going on? But just telling people they were already working on a vaccine before the pandemic hit. And because of the magnitude, so many people dying, so many people being affected, they diverted all their forces to developing this vaccine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, telling them, you know, we did certain things. We're going through the clinical trials just to make sure people know that it's safe. Yeah. It's so great, too, that like she understood that like not only is she going to use her knowledge and experience and all of the wisdom that she has to work directly on creating the vaccine, she's then making it digestible, like she said, to everyone to understand, hey, I'm going to explain to you exactly what this is and exactly why mm-hmm. this is safe. And and that's so important. When you have someone that is a member of a marginalized community, when you have a Black woman who can then go, hey, I'm a part of this. I helped create this. I believe in this. So therefore, mm-hmm. I want you to be able to trust me and listen to me. And, and that's so important when you have someone that looks like you, that is a member of your community, saying that because you, you then can believe that because you know it's coming from someone who actually does care about your life and does and does care about you you getting through this pandemic. Right. And I just wanted to shout her out. You know, she made a huge contribution to the vaccine that is saving so many lives. Like the magnitude of this pandemic could have been a lot worse without the vaccine. So her contribution is amazing. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Dr. Susan Moore's treatment exemplifies what many Black and marginalized individuals experience when navigating the American healthcare system. Unfortunately, education cannot protect us from mistreatment, whether in a hospital or any other system. If you would like to share your personal story or shout out an organization, please email us at distrustanddisparities at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.